Hello learners. Today we will talk for the course of leadership LED 3665 in the California Miramar University at the Bachelor of Science level. We will talk about the chapter seven of your textbook. Uh, in previous chapter, in chapter six, we talk about the different styles and different approaches to leadership with an emphasis on charismatic leadership and transformational leadership and transactional leadership and value-based leadership styles. This is not only one style, for example, seven leadership. Now we are talking about the leadership from another aspect. We are talking about the level of leadership and at the end, we will have a very specific discussion about the NGOs, non-governmental organization or nonprofit organizations. Sometimes they are NGOs, sometimes they are nonprofit. And it is a very different and um, sometimes in oppositional aspects of general organization like for-profit for organization. Nonprofit organizations is another discussion, another title, another topic for thinking about as a leader or as a manager. So in this chapter, at first, we will talk about the upper echelon leaderships or high level leadership or general managers, CEOs, CFOs or CAOs. And as you like to talk about it, as the C level, C level is everything is, begins with uh, capital C, for example, chief organization, chief uh, administrative officer or chief executive officer or chief financial financial officer to CFO, CEO, CA or other. It is called C level so for the managers or officers at the chief level. Okay. At first, we will talk about it. Yes, it is. What are our learning objective in this week? We are talking about differentiate between micro and upper echelon leadership. Describe the domain and roles of strategic leaders in the management of an organization. Identify the external and internal factors that impact the strategic leaders is discretion. List the individual characteristic of a strategic leaders and their impact on leadership style. Contrast the four strategic leadership styles and discuss the role of culture and gender in a strategic leadership. Explain the processes through which strategic leaders manage their organizations. Review issues of executive compensation and accountability. And finally, describe the characteristic and challenges of leadership in number of it organization. Except of the final and the last objective, others are related to the strategic management and about the leadership, future oriented leadership. As we know, there is no leader without any future orientation. So what are the factors, differentiated factors between leaders and micro leaders and upper echelon leaders? We should talk about four areas with four uh, question or for four topic. At first, who the leader is? There's a huge difference between the personality and the character of the leader and the target of the leader. After that, we will talk about the scope of leadership, the scope of responsibility of leadership, who the leader is. The second one is the scope of responsibility. The third, the focus of leadership. And four, it is effectiveness criteria. What are the effectiveness criteria of leadership? When we want to talk about the who the leader is, 
when we are talking about micro leadership, we are talking about the teams, departments, groups. So one person who is responsible, who is heading a group, who is heading a team, who is heading a department. Why? Because it is the micro leadership, not macro leadership, not huge leadership, not operational leadership, or as we can say, it is up level leadership. Okay. And after that, we can find the leader in the organizations, in the operation of leadership in the organizations. It is called up level organization or operational leadership organizations. And if I check the, okay. Someone, uh, it can be uh, in upper, uh, upper uh, leadership or operational leadership. We can have different types of leadership. Sometimes only one person in C level, CFO, CEO, or for example, CAO, chief academic officer or chief uh, financial officer or chief executive officer. Sometimes it is a team. For example, uh, TMT, it is top management team. Sometimes it is the board of governance, for example, board of directors. So for operational leadership, for operational management, we can use sometimes one person, sometimes a team, sometimes a body of governance, for example, directors, a team of directors. They are operational team or operational responsible for uh, leadership or management and organization. The second part in the scope of responsibility. It is obvious that when you are a micro leader, the scope of your responsibility is uh, very, for example, um, scope of responsibility is not all the organization, not all the corporation, not all the um, Total, for example, if you are not in an organization, if you are in a social leadership, when you are upper leadership, you own, own the whole organization. But in micro leadership in organizations, in societies, in communities, your scope of responsibility is about the effectiveness, for example, of your customers, effectiveness, satisfaction of your employees, or for example, turnover of your job. It is about the, your team, about your department. But when you are talking about the operational leadership in an organization, you are talking about the, the scope, your scope of responsibility is all the general or all the parts of integral parts, external or internal parts of your organization. So um, in, it is not important to look at, the, for example, the, um, your employee satisfaction. We can consider whole organization as an integral part and create between the external and internal factors some harmonization. It is something like a, when you are, for example, a one instrument player, you only play your instrument, okay? But when you are a leader of an orchestra, orchestration, you should consider all the players in a harmonization together to have a good piece of music or a masterpiece of music. So operational leadership is like a leader of an orchestration, but mid-level or lower level or micro leadership is about, for example, uh, percussion instruments only one part, only one department. And the focus is again, about the satisfaction in the department, about the efficiency of the department and the responsibility of the department of the team. But when we are talking about the operational leadership, we are talking about the whole and holistic uh, focal points. For example, stock market, 
stakeholders or shareholders and customer service at the general part, not at the department part. At the general part of our organization is the focus. And effectiveness of criteria for micro leadership or micromanagement is about the effectiveness criteria is about the effectiveness of your, for example, employees, your customers, your very specific, specialistic jobs you should do. But in general, you should attend, for example, your organization as a general part and see the, what are the main value and the up and down, for example, stock market. Is it good? Is the financial record? Is it the marketing outside of the organization? When you are operational, you are sometimes between manager and leader. So I'm going forward for the next step and to enhancing the area of uh, the work of organization. We have six domain of strategic leaders. These domains are environment, structure, leadership, culture, strategy, technology. These are the six forces or six domain of strategic leaders, which work together to combine together, to mix together, to shape or shaping in a strategic, a strategic leadership, seeing the future of the organization and planning, you know, that between the mission and the vision of an organization, we have a strategy. A strategy is the way to achieve our visions from the starting point of our missions. The strategy should where to go, how to go, uh, what are the final visions of the organization and changing and converting the visions of the organization to the goals. So because of that, we have six forces of a strategic leaders or six domain of a strategic leaders. The structure is the structure of organization. The strategy, we talk about it. Leadership style, for example, are your charismatic style leader or transformative leader, transactional leader or value-based leader. Culture has two parts, culture of the society that we are living as the social members and work together to organize an organization, to shape an organization for a specific productivity, for a specific production and specific level of productivity and effectiveness. This is the culture. Specific, uh, specifically in organization, we are talking about the organizational cultures, the norms, the values, the essence of the behaviors in an organization. It is called organizational culture. After that, we talk about the strategy. The strategy is about working together for our vision, for the vision of uh, organization and having long-term and future-oriented thinking. We have different types of strategic, strategic uh, actions. The first thing is the strategic thinking. It can be used for all people. Everybody should know about the strategic thinking, even in his or her everyday life experiences. Why? Because without strategic thinking, it is like that you don't know where do you want to go and how do you want to go and know a specific goal. You are living in a cloud of cloudiness of goals. You are confused, it is ambiguity of goals. And after that, it is the ex most external and controllable and progressive part of our leadership. It's about technology. Some financial, some substantial, some technical facilities we can use for acting based upon our strategy as a strategic leader, a strategic manager. And finally, it is environment. Environment usually considered as the external part of an organization. For example, society or natural environment or political environment or economic up and downs or some specific 
of parts like, for example, COVID-19 is a part of environment influencers on the strategic leadership. You cannot separate these six forces, these six strategies from each other for a strategy, for a strategic leadership. We cannot separate them from each other. Why? Because they work together to shape a strategic leadership successfully. Work together. Consider each of them separate. For example, a structure and leadership. The structure and environment, the structure and culture, leadership and culture, culture and strategy, strategy and technology, technology and environment. Is there any trend and in, is there any pathway? Yes, it seems that one item before or one item after of one single item shows the main dominant factors to determine that item. For example, it seems the highest influence on the structure is of environment and leadership. We a structure, we make a structure of our organization based upon the environment and to our leadership style. And we give our, our style, we make our leadership style based upon the, our structure and to our culture and culture between leadership and strategy, strategy between culture and technology and technology between the strategy and environment. And again, environment between technology and structure. It is a circle that we can consider for different parts. L strategic leaders have two roles. One, performance low role, two, formulative role. At first, they should formulate some thinking in their minds and show it as a strategic leadership plan. And second part, it is about performance. Performance is the action plan and the active part of their leadership. It is the part of leadership that you can observe as an external observer. It is performance. You see that we go from leadership to a strategy formulation and to performance again. Performance before a strategy formulation, yes. So you see that there's a reciprocal relationship between a strategy implementation and performance and performance and strategy formulation and strategy formulation and strategy implement implementation. Why? Because we live in a live world. Nothing is absolutely true and nothing is absolutely predictable. It is trial and error. What is the role of intelligence? What is the role of to be a smart and to have to a smart system? The role of having a smart system, the role of to be intelligent, artificial intelligence or real and humanistic intelligence, the role of them is based upon feedback. Based upon the feedbacks from the previous stages, we can consider and correct and recorrect the next step of our flow chart. As we, if we want to talk in a computer science language, that you see between three parts, formulation, implementation, and performance. The reciprocal and feedback-based communication, feedback-based system. And again, between leadership and strategy formulation, we have some moderating factors. Moderating factors between leadership and strategy formulation, some part related to the leadership and leader specific character and personality. Some part is about the previous history of organization. Some parts is about our prediction as a leader, our prediction of the future, that where are we going and some part is about our vision and our mission. These are moderating factor between leadership and strategy formulation. Based upon these moderating factors, facilitating some are uh, inhibitor factors or moderating factors. Some of them are facilitating, facilitating factors. 
both parts are moderating actors, moderate the leadership between the relationship between leadership, going to a strategy formulation. After a strategy formulation, we have two parts, implementation and performance, performance and implementation, and again, formulation. Well, another way is this direct way from leadership to performance. Okay. Moderators of executive discretion. We have two parts as every other things. The every other things, we have always two parts, internal parts, external parts, subjective parts, objective parts, and relationship between two parts, physical experiment, mental experiment, subjective experiment, objective experiment, internal experiment, external experiment, okay? We have two parts of executive discretion as the moderators. One part is ex external factors, other parts is about internal factors. External factors can be solved and can be facilitate and can be softening, can be softened during the process of formulation. Internal factors are very important because sometimes the internal factors, internal moderator of executive discretion are some major parts of organization, structure of organization. At first, we are considering the external executive, external moderators of executive discretion. First, uncertainty. We talk about it several times, and we will talk about it several times in the future in different aspects of management and leadership, and also in different areas of management and leadership, social management, social leadership and political management, political leadership, industrial management, industrial leadership. If I want to talk about a specific, very, very cutoff point, the point that distinguish between managers and leaders in behavior, in thinking, in thought style, it is ambiguity control or ambiguity management. What is the basic difference between a person from general population and an educated man or woman like you for managing a company, for managing a family, for leadership, for the future oriented goals? The main part is about ambiguity tolerance and ambiguity handling and ambiguity or confusion handling, uncertainty handling, uncertainty management. Why? We can predict and control the real world, but it is not complete. It is relatively controllable. We have four function for a scientific theory or for science. First is description of the reality. Two, find the cause and effect relationship between the different components of a theory or different components of the phenomenon. It is called uh, it is called explanation. Three, based upon the previous facts and on my, our findings in the first two parts, description and explanation, we can have a good prediction of the future action of the future of that theory of that phenomenon. And four, we can make and manufacture some tools or create some skills, for example, in human beings, for controlling and manipulating and handling those predictions. So we have four areas of science. 
description, explanation, prediction, and control. At the essence, in the essence of prediction is uncertainty. There is no prediction that which can be absolutely certain, absolutely clear, always with some degree of uncertainty, some degree of ambiguity we are facing in an organization, in society, in family, or even in ourselves as a human being. It is very important to know the uncertainty points in our life. And more important is that after knowing them, more important that is control handling and tolerating them. People who cannot tolerate ambiguity, uncertainty, people who cannot have a good ambiguity tolerance or uncertainty tolerance, they will feel and they will experience a high level of anxiety, a high level of depression, a high level of bad thinking and bad feeling about the future, about the other parts of life. So, the first external moderator of executive discretion is uncertainty. Second part is about the type of industry. Which type of industry our executive is working on? Is he or she is working on a car industry, educational industry, insurance in industry? There's a good tradition in America and US that we have industry, we, work, we use the word of industry for every aspect of professional life, insurance industry. Sometimes we say, for example, life coaching industry. I said, is it industry or is it the manufacturing? No, industry is about the all types of productions or services that you are providing to your customers, to your clients. So we say, for example, insurance industry, cinema industry, art industry even sometimes, and life coaching industry. It is related to type of industry that you are the executive manager or you are the executive, for example, leader or CEO. It's very important as an external. It's not related to the organization or yourself. It is about the type of the industry you are acting manager, management or leadership. Market growth. If you work with the platforms of the trading, stock market trading, you see that there are a lot of instruments, a lot of tools to predicting the future of the prices. And as they said, it is uptrending and downtrending. When it is uptrending, you should buy. And when it is downtrending, you should sell. And before buying and sell, you'll, you will have a good profit and benefit. Okay? But sometimes, for example, at this time, when the president is changing, or at this time with the socioeconomic health crisis, so-called COVID-19, all around the world, it is not uh, for one country or two countries, it is pandemic all around the world, it is not epidemic, epidemic is very local, pandemic is very global, pandemic. The market growth will be disturbing. You cannot have a good prediction of the rate of growth in the market. But usually, in the general and the usual markets, one of the moderator, external moderator of executive discretion is about market growth. Not only the rate of market growth, but the type of growth that you can see in the market. Is it the growth of price? Is it the, uh, is it the growth of, for example, only demanding, only supplying, all the growth of industry, the growth of technological growth. It is related to the different parts of market. And as a 
as a capitalistic country, America is a capitalistic economic country, we have legal constraints for doing actions in economic part or in, uh, in the market. We have legal constraints. What is the legal constraint? For example, there's a very old, I think it is from 1912, that it is forbidden to consider a market in the hand of very specific people, very specific industry. It is called trust. And we have a very good, solid, and very rough law about antitrust. Antitrust is very important, for example. It is a legal constraint or some legal constraint for environment, some legal constraint for insurance, some legal constraint for the tax or for distribution or for packing or for quality control. For example, quality control and quality circuits in car industry, automobile industry, it's very important. Why? Because if there is no good quality control and quality circuits, Sorry, a lot of people can be killed during the car crashes or car accidents. These are the legal constraints as the external moderator of executive discretion. Other moderators of, are about internal factors. One, stability. <clears throat> we are talking the internal factors of an organization, of a corporation. One, two, three, five, four. Stability, size and structure, culture, stage of organizational development, and TMT. Top management team. At first, stability. Which market or which industry the company, the organization is working in? And what is the age of organization? It's an old organization. The shaping of different parts of internal parts of organization is good and stable or not. They are dynamic and changing from one part. It's a young organization. Do you know? You know that, for example, like families, like life, it's a life circle, life circle. We have family circle, we have industrial circle, organizational life circle. It is about the events and stages that an organization should pass to be matured in the future, to grow in the future. We have some developmental stages. Which stage this organization is? For example, entrepreneurship, sometimes it is the first or pre-organization pre stage, the stage that we are talking and brainstorming and idea, uh, idea making about our entrepreneurship. It is a part of organization life cycle, yes. With a high, with a, so, sorry, with the lowest level of stability, why? Because we need different aspects of an idea or sometimes we have different, we, we need different ideas, not different aspects of one single idea. So we need some different ideas about one aspect of organization, one aspect of job, one aspect of market. It is a stable, not at all. It is good that it is not a stable. We need brainstorming, it is the type of a storming. But after some years that you find the organizational goal, yes, that is the point of a st stability in, a, in, a, in an organization. Size and structure of organization. It is the second moderator of executive discretion. Why? More and more and more, the number of employees, the number of customers, the number of uh, freelancers for an organization. Some parts like customers or freelancers are not very internal. Yes, it seems that they are external parts of our organization. They are external moderators of our organization, but the influence on our stability 
and marketing uh, success of organization is very huge. They have, a, they have a huge impact on our organization. Basically, the size of employees, the amount of employees, the number of managers in different level, level of manager, mid-level managers, high-level management, higher Islam management, up-level management, and other parts. The second. And the structure. Is it a group-based organization? Group, 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 group? No. It's an internal organization. It is very related to the size. Greater size, higher amount of groups, higher amount of development, uh, departments, sorry. Higher amount of, higher numbers of team. Greater size. Why? We should divide a greater, a great number of employees, a great number of co-workers to different specific and special group for our organization. But if the size is not so high, the number of employees is not very high, okay, we can divide in two or three groups with a very simple defined structure and culture. Again, we are talking about the organizational culture. Organizational culture is about uh, the norms of a culture. Sometimes, you know, we have some uh, hidden leaders in an organization. They are not the serious leader. They are hidden leaders of an organization. So we want to know about the impact of hidden leaders in an organization, about the uh, down leaders or mm, very, very unknown leaders, the leaders that they have a good and important impact on our decision making, but they are not formal leaders and formal factors. And sometimes they are not so observable you know, in be between the uh, simple workers, but they have some interpersonal, good and effective interpersonal relationships. Sometimes they have some leadership role between the lower level of organization and they shape the cultural organization. They define the norms and values and the standards of an organization. They are not formal, yes, we know what they are. They are in our organization and they have an important role in our organization. A stage of organizational development, we talk about it in the discussion about organizational life circle and TMT, top management team. When we were talking about the differences between micro leadership and higher echelon leadership, we talk about the TMT as one of the sources of management leadership in an, in a, in an organization, in a high level organization. It is some people together as the management, it, uh, some people together do the role of management in an organization. Uh, what is the difference between TMT and for example, uh, board of directors? Board of directors have some different ideas about one thing, can have some different ideas about one thing. And finally into the single common idea and common decision for the organization, it is good. But uh, top management team, it is about the management of different parts of an organization and come together and talking and thinking and having some sometimes different, sometimes similar decisions about different parts of organization. It is very important, why? Because if there are more differences between the members of top, top management team in that case, we cannot use this uh, management team uh, as a good unit for decision-making an organization. They can destroy and they can uh, create a, some degree of disturbance or turbulence in the organization. Because of that, in your book says that TMT is an internal moderator of executive discretion. Characteristic of upper echelon 
liters. Before entering this part, we will have for uh, 10 minutes break and after that we will continue the course.
Okay, we'll come back. And now after that, we talk about the characteristic of upper echelon Yes, it's good. And to characteristic of operational leaders. Challenge seeking and need for control. One part is challenge seeking. It's very important for any type of leadership to seek the challenges. Challenges and an opportunity for growth, not the problems as the barriers against our goals. Challenges are the opportunities for growth. It is the difference between challenge and problem, between challenge and difficulty. So everything is relative to your attitude, to your problems. If you can see the problems as the challenges, you can find the opportunity for growth in your challenges. If you cannot do it, okay, these are the problems, these are the difficulties. And risk taking. At first is the operational leaders in the theme of challenge seeking, they are risk takers. All leaders are risk takers. You cannot find any leader who cannot have any, any risk taking. Risk taking is the first part of challenge seeking. What is the main important core concept in the challenge? It is risk. Challenge has a risky situation. An openness to change again. After risk taking, yes, we invite every type of changes to our life. Openness to change. As leaders are open, uh, open to experience, they can uh, experience the changes. And willingness to innovate. They have a higher willingness to innovate. This is very important. Novelty seeking is one of the greatest and one of the major concepts we can cover for all aspects of a leader, operational leader. They, are not, they have a high degree of novelty seeking and future orientation. We talked about this several times that all types of leaders are future oriented. We'll talk about it again in the next PowerPoint slide. And need for control, they have delegation, they have centralization, uniformity of practices, and focus on process. We have four teams, four teams for need for control in operational people: delegation, centralization, uniformity of practices, and focus on process. So we have four teams for challenge seeking and four teams for needs for control in operational leaders. First theme, risk taking. A little milder, it is openness to change. A little milder is willingness to innovate. And the basic part of leadership is future orientation. It's about the severity. And the other parts, when we are talking, about the teams of need for control. At first is delegation, higher rate. Next is centralization, a little milder. Of uh, uniformity of practices, a lower. And focus on process, is this the lowest team for need for control in? You can see here. So we have two parts of need for control, high control and low control. And two parts and two extreme points of Challenge seeking is high challenge seekers and lower challenge seekers. We have two parts. It is high control innovator, participated innovator, status quo guardian, and process manager, so PM. With the high level of control, need for control, and high level of challenge seeking, we can see high control innovator the combination of high degree of need for control or high degree of challenge seeking. We call them high control innovator. But if you have a high 
level a high degree of challenge seeking, but need for, need for control is not so high. You are a participative innovator. So when you have a high degree of challenge seeking, you are innovator, high control innovator or participative innovator. It is related to the degree of need for control. But if you have lower level of challenge seeking, you are not innovator. You are guardian, you are manager. And it is different about the degree of need for control. A lower level of need for change or challenge seeking and a higher level of need for control, you are a status quo guardian. You are take care, uh, caretaker. And if you are with a level, lower level of need for control and also a lower level of challenge seeking, you are process manager. So HCI, high control innovator, PI, participative innovator, SQG, status quo guardian, and PM or process manager. What are the features of each categorization? At first, high control innovators, people with high degree of control, desire high, desire, high degree of desire for control, and also for, with a high uh, degree of challenge seeking. They are HCI, they are challenge seeker, leader who maintains tight control of the organization. Very, very challenge seekers. They are the challenge seekers, leaders who maintaining tight control of the organization. And participative innovator, people, leaders with lower need for control, lower desire for control, but high challenge seeking. Challenge seeker leader, again, who delegates control of the organization. Delegation with the other people, with the other uh, employees or other co-workers. In lower level of challenge seeking, but high level of need for control or desire for control, you see status quo guardian, challenge average leader, average, challenge average leader, they don't like challenge because of lower challenge seeking. They, are, they like security, safety, status quo who maintains tight control of the organization. So you see in high desire of control at both parts, you see that tight desire of control, very direct, very unflexible control, unflexible uh, manner to control the organization. But with the lower desire for control and lower desire for challenge or challenge seeking, you see process manager leaders, they are challenge average leaders who delegates control to the organization. When you are tight control, you cannot delegate. When you can delegate, it is not a tight control of the organization. It's related to the desire of control, okay? Other discussion is about the impact of culture and gender in organization. There's a very basic and traditional discussion about the roles of culture and importance of considering this role on organization in two parts, external culture and internal culture, which is called usually organizational culture. External culture is the culture about the future. External culture is the culture about the external part of the organization. For example, social culture, religious culture, political norms, political and geographical culture, some political culture, which roots in the political, in the geographical situation of a country, of a nation. For example, some political geographical culture of Middle East, some political, uh, geographical cultures of Southern, for example, South Africa, one specific part of Africa, okay? So we, when we are talking and we are considering culture as a main impact factor on organizational behavior, at first we should, we should uh, consider 
the external culture of the organization. And after that, we are talking about the norms and behaviors and rituals and values and standards of internal parts of an organization that harmonize and shape the relationship, interpersonal or very formal relationship between different parts and different teams and different developments and different groups and different single people, single employees, one employee to another employee. In the area of organization related problems or organization related concern and issues. These are shaping the organiza internal organizational culture. Different countries have different implicit leadership theories. At this type, we are talking about the external culture of an organization. For example, when you are living in a socialistic country, like, for example, Norway or Sweden or Denmark, full socialistic economy country with a high rate of social welfare and also with a high rate of tax, very high rate. I think it is about 70% of your net income is for your tax, gross income is for your tax, but with a high level of social welfare, very high level. Different countries have different implicit leadership theories or some value-based countries like, for example, some uh, countries who want to be the super world power, the next superpowers of the world with a specific religious or political directions. They dictate some specific implicit procedures of leadership. Or no, in America, as a capitalistic economy country, a country with the dominance of not wealth, the dominance of capital. Capital is not net money as not the wealth. Wealth is something more than capital and money is something lower than capital. Capital is something between the money and wealth. Different countries have, have different implicit leadership theories. You see that this type of leadership, for, for example, in America, needs some democratic basic a basis of leadership in the organization. For example, it is anti-racism, freedom of speech, pursuit of happiness, and antitrust laws, laws for capitalistic system is very important. Yes, it is very important. Because of that, you should know that, yes, what country you are shaping, you are um, framing your organization, external factors, external cultures, and internal cultures. It's very regular, very, we can see it frequently in the organizations that internal organizational culture is severely impacted by the external social or political or religious or sometimes geographical base cultures. For example, when you uh, work in a very, very hot area like Amazon jungles, if you work there, it's a geography based culture. Yes, I know it is not related to uh, politics or related to economy, it is a geography based, but very, very specific situation. On the other side, if you work, for example, in North Pole, in Alaska, it is geography-based cultures. Very specific geography dictates very specific internal and external cultures, the organization. So you as the manager and as the leader should know and consider these internal and external cultural factors when you want to have some effective and long-term decision makers, decision makings. Why? Because you are the leader and you should consider these factors in the, per, uh, in the perspective of your decisions. Except that you are not the leader. You are the permanent decision maker 
you are not a permanent, you're a temporary decision maker. At the first, at the best scenario, you are a good manager. As a leader, you should consider these factors in the perspective of your decisions. Why? Because these are the determ determining factors in the goodness and the efficiency of your decisions. Other part is gender. We know that there is a long-term struggle to have the similar rights for female and male. Sometimes it is called, for example, uh, anti-female or anti-male movement, especially for feminism. Feminism is the movement, is the thought school of equality of men and women. In the social rights, yes. Organizational rights, yes. Work rights. It is a movement. They are working on gaining some similar, some equal rights for both genders. And sometimes I think it may be a concentration for more values in one specific gender. For example, more values for females, for women, or more values for men, for males. But it is a very traditional and very old and sometimes it's very ancient discussion about the similarities and equalities between men and women in social rights, in political rights. Do you know, for example, in Saudi Arabia, we have a good movement movement for giving the right of vote to women. Why? Because before, for example, until them, I think three or four years ago, or maybe sooner, um, women didn't have any right to vote for social elections, for example, for the prime minister, for the city council, for other parts that men had a high rate and high power of giving vote and uh, have contribution in political decision makings, but women didn't have, or uh, right of driving, especially in the countries that they have some uh, basic tribal or religious or very dogmatic thinking about the gender, about the male or female is concentrated on female because we see, we think that females are always uh, under pressure for uh, for their social rights. But sometimes it may be about the male. It's not important about the which sexual, which sexuality, which gender. It is about the similarities and equality. So little research on role of gender in operation. One of the things you should consider is that when we are talking about the university, we are talking and thinking about the research, about the evidence-based facts, facts which are derived from research, academic research based upon the research method approved, for example, by APA or by other scientific source, for example, universities, accredited universities. So we are talking about the research findings. We are not about to talk about the personal views or personal ideas or personal interpretation. One of the question was that for an upper echelon manager, for an upper echelon leadership situation, it's better to choose a man or a woman. Is there any differences between men and women for efficiency on, uh, on performing uh, an upper echelon leadership situation? Research shows that, research findings shows that there is no specific dominancy for women or for men to have an operational leadership. It is about the skills, about the personality characteristic, about the type of industry, about the previous and history of experience of him or her as a future operational manager or leader. It is not concentrated on the sexuality, on the gender, it is concentrated on the experience, on the resume, on the, on the social uh, situation and political circumstances and cultural and organizational, internal and external organizational cultures. These are related to the factors that can impact 
other roles of an organization, not specific to the gender of the manager. And fewer women in executive leadership positions. Why? It is about the type of industry. At first, I think new uh, research shows that no, executive leaders can be very successful in uh, for female, not only for male. Secondly, execution sometimes needs uh, some direct and very, very rigid thinking for decision making. So we have a new generation of women which are very, who are very good executive leaders in the organizations and the right of and the share on the proportion of female are rising in executive leadership situations. We talk about the six areas of leadership and now we are talking about the, uh, their influence on their organization. Leader, it is direct decisions, allocation of resources, reward system, selection of other leaders, promotions and role modeling in six parts, environment, strategy, six areas, six forces, structure, culture, technology, and leadership. They should have these, they should have played these roles. At first, direct decisions, the basic, the most critical, the most crucial factor, the most crucial function of a leader is decision-making, very direct. If you cannot have some good direct decisions, decisions, okay, you are not a leader. And after the allocation of resources, we have some limitations of resources, financial resources, governmental resources, social resources, environmental resources, resources, technological resources, human resources. We have a lot of limitations in our resources. So we should consider some specific part of each resource of each source to the priority of our organization. It is like a personal life. If you cannot set your priorities right, you cannot be successful and happy and satisfied in your life. It is very important, very, very important. If you can set your priorities right in your mind and also in the paper to write specific priorities. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. At first, your first five priority should be always clear for you. With the numbers, the number shows that if I don't have enough money and time and effort to do for the this goal, what other goal is more important? Which is first, which is second, which is third? For allocation of resources, financial resources, energy resources, resources, even scientific and knowledge resources, we have a lot of uh, limitations to science. Not internet is not science, it's data pollution. There are a lot of data pollution on internet. For example, everybody in university says to you that Wikipedia is not a valid source for literacy. It's a very general information and a lot of false edition and a lot of uh, data pollution. Even in science, we have some limitations for reading, for understanding, for accessing the valid articles, the valid sources. So after decision making, that what decisions are more important the second part in six areas is what are the proportion of every resource, environmental resources, leadership resources, and other areas, allocation of resources. Third part is reward system. Reward system is not a word from management, a word from leadership, it is a word from psychology. It is a word from the approach of behaviorism in psychology. How can we shape behavior in other people? How can we shape 
behavior in other people. Sometimes it is about animal psychology. How can we shape behaviors in animals, in circus training? Or for example, dog training, pet training, shaping behavior. How to go to the toilet, how to have, for example, some specific behavior, good behavior in social situations for our pets. It's a type of training, so shaping behavior. The basic neural parts of shaping all types of behavior is the reward and punishment circuit in your brain. We have a very specific old noun. We know it from the oldest parts, for example, about, I think, 50 years ago. It is old for neuroscience because neuroscience has a near 30 years. And when we are talking 50 years, it is between the formal presentation of neuroscience or neuropsychology and other parts which are related to the brain studies. One of the first parts which was known in neuroscience and neurology was a reward in the brain, a, a circuit in the brain, so-called reward and punish, reward punishment brain, uh, brain or reward punishment circuit. So a good leader should know about the shaping behavior in his or her follower, in his or her employee, in his or her uh, employees or co-workers should know the basic knowledge of reward system to reinforce the currency and recurrency of a behavior. And sometimes how to punish them to stop the reinforce or to decrease the reinforce, to decrease the recurrency rate of the behavior. It is the shaping behavior in other people. And selection of other leaders, a good leaders, a good leader is someone with good counselors, with good uh, selection of other leaders in other parts of his or her organization. And promotion also, we know about the promotion styles, about the promotion strategies. It is very important, especially for organization, for sales part, promotion is very important. And finally, which is very characteristic and very personality-based feature of a leader is role modeling. Well, what is role modeling? A role model is someone who walk the talk, who can be the uh, face and figure for other people to modeling their life roles, their actual roles from him. It is the role modeling part of leadership. And direct decisions, we have six parts. We talk about them in the previous sessions and also in the uh, previous minutes about the vision, mission, strategy, structure, organizational culture and selection of other leaders. There's a triology and triad between vision, mission, strategy. The way to gain the vision is a strategy. Vision said, why we are here? What is our message to the world? What do we want to do in the world? What is the final perspective of our organization? Is it only earning money? Yes. People can give us their money because of the services. What type of services, what type of senses we want to provide in our customers? Don't forget. Sales begin with emotions, not with rationality. People choose you and your company because of their emotions about you and your company, about your services, about your productions. They didn't come to you by their rationality. Rationality support their emotions, I know. But the final skate, final criteria for choosing one company, choosing one product is their emotions. After buying, for maintenance part, yes. It is important to have a good rationale, to have a good logic in the back of the, their sales. Yes, it's important. 
it is not very new about, I think, 20 years that we have a good interdisciplinary field, so-called neuro business, neuro business or neuro um, marketing or neuro leadership. You can search it in the uh, internet. We are talking about the good features of brain for buyers or for the sales forces about different part of brain. It's very important. A vision, mission, and a strategy. And a structure, organizational culture, and selection of other leaders that we should have direct, direct decisions in this area as the leader, as the manager. Allocation of resources and reward system. Decision regarding funding and budgets. Financial limitations, yes. Financial funding, you know, it is very important and very popular. It is fundraising, fundraising for something we want to do. Decision regarding funding and budgets. You should consider your financial sources. Allocation of resources to support goals. It is very important. If your resources are not at the same page of your goals, you cannot achieve your goals. And formal rewards such as a salary or bonuses. It's very formal, very formal. Formal salaries are very important, but very old and external. Their effectiveness will reduce as soon as possible. Why? Because yes, for poor people, money is very important. But after a level of, not rich men, a level of easy of access to our basic life sources, money doesn't work as the basic reward system. People are, for example, you see in the modern countries like America, you see that a lot of people are seeking regard are seeking prestige, are seeking social credit. Yes, income and money is a sign and symptom of prestige and social credit, but only one sign and one symptom, one symbol of social credit, not the main symbol. For the first appearance, general appearance, yes. Your car is, a, for example, a symbol of your social prestige. But for the general population, when you go to the deeper level and deepest level of your society, you see that, yes, rich people doesn't, uh, at first doesn't know and doesn't want to know about your income. They want to know about your personality, about your financial personality. How do you think about money? Can you consider money as the basic tools for your welfare or not is the final source for your social welfare or your uh, personal welfare. It is very important. So now in industrial psychology, we are talking about the informal bonuses, informal rewards, such as recognition. It is very important. Such as the organizational prestige and promotion of other leaders and managers that we talk about. Setting the norm and role modeling. It is other part of functions of a leader. Especially in social leadership, in social movement, you see the norm setting by leaders. It is very important. Norm says that how our leader think about the world. Norms are the symbols and the outcomes of our worldview. Sometimes, um, behavioral norms gained from a specific worldview is called ideology. Ideology is the behavioral part of worldview. So one of the greatest features of a great leader is to thinking about the norms in an operational condition, operational concepts, and also role modeling. And after that, when I dictate you and I have a good pressure on the followers to accept my norms as their own norms, 
Before that, they are not my, our followers. They are only uh, viewers and audience. Follower, following is something more deeper, very more deeper, much deeper than to be an uh, audience. Following is acceptance your norms, acceptance your uh, worldview, acceptance of your ideology, your ritual, your mindset. In that position, we call them our followers, yes. Before that, they are audience, they are observers. So for being a good leader, to dictate the norms, to dictate the um, lifestyle and mindset of your mindset, of your um, thought school to your followers, you should be their role model. Role model is someone that you can model your life roles from him or her. Active or subtle role modeling of wanted behaviors and style and setting decision criteria and rules by which others make decisions. What are the basic and most important responsibility of a strategic leaders? One, organizational performance. Two, internal health organizational culture. Three, accountability to internal and external constituents. And four, ethical behavior and role modeling. These are the responsibility of strategic leaders. Again, we talk that, honestly, we don't have any non-strategic leaders. If you are a non-strategic leader, you are not a leader. You're a manager. Leaders are future-oriented. Non-leaders are not. And finally, we know that in a strategic leadership, we know that, yes, you can find the future-oriented thinking, decision-making, and risk-taking for a strategic leaders. So in organizational performance, it is one of the res responsibilities of a strategic leader. A strategic leaders should explain their plan for the future and future-oriented plans in the terms of performance, what are the major performance of our organization to achieve the predefined goals of the organization? Even these predefined uh, organizational goals are defined by the same leader or not, by the previous leaders, by the previous manager, or even by the owners, or by the stakeholders, by the shareholders. It is not important. It is important that every type of organization has some basic discipline and final goals. If you want to change this basic principles on organization, for example, if you want to change the basic concept on the political party, sometimes you are something more than a leader. You are a thinker, you are a fundamental leader. So for general population conceptualization of leadership, one of the criteria that a leader should be responsible and accountable for that is the organizational performance, efficiency, what are the outcomes, what are, how is the ratio between output and input of organization, uh, how, what about the stock market and other parts. These are the organizational performance. Other parts is internal health organizational culture. We talk about the organizational culture, about the norms, about the values, about the standards, about the rituals, about the virtues in the organization. If you can consider an organization as a character, as a personality, as a human being, you can consider some humanistic characteristic of human being for your organization. For example, how happy this organization is how satisfy, satisfiable working with this organization is. For example, if you have a wife or a husband, you think this, how ha happy I am in living with my wife or with my husband, with my spouse, okay? You can consider an organization like a human being and consider the same features for high quality of relationship with your spouse, with your friends, with your partner, with your relationships. You can consider those characteristics for your organization as a happy organization, happy institution, it's very important. You can search an in internet for this word, positive organizational leadership, 
or happy organizations or happiness at workplace. These are very formal academic phrases, as, uh, at least in positive psychology as a science, not as an approach to a human. So science is research based finding, findings are from our research in the field of positive psychology. So in internal health organizational culture, we are talking about the culture that working and playing some games between the healthy parts and the organizational parts. Are people working in an organization have a good level of mental health or physical health? Are this organization, um, does this organization or uh, leadership have a good and rigid emphasis, serious emphasis, severe emphasis on mental health and physical health of the personnel? And it is internal. And accountability of internal and external constitute. It is very important. We talk about the role of accountability and responsibility for a good, effective, future-oriented, decisive leadership. Because to be decisive is one of the important, most important features of leadership. We are really on decisive. How can you want, how do you want to have a good decision at the to have a permanent decision about your organization, your life. Because of that, we say that every type of uh, coaching begins with self-coaching. Every type of leadership begins with, begins with self-leadership. And finally, ethical behavior and role modeling, which is very important. And also we talk about it previous. Oh, one of the factors of salaries of executives, it is size of organization greater organizations pay more money to the executive managers and industry competition. More competitive the organization is, more salary the executive managers will receive. Why? Because they're hard work to be a competitive atmosphere, competitive space of industry. So it is very important that is it a unique and um, monopole or industry or not? It's a competitive organization that the executive manager should consider this competition in his or her decisions. CEO power and discretion. More power of CEO, more discretion, and more money and salary the executive manager should receive. Why? Because the power is a part of accountability. More power, more accountability. More accountability, more decision making. More decision making, more anxiety. It's a Model of Freud also that civilization ends to anxiety. Why? Civilization, civilization is meant to have many rights of choice. Many rights of choice have to many uh, accountability to the rights of choice. And accountability uh, leads to anxiety because you should be accountable. You should be responsible to your uh, choices, to your right of choices. Because of that, Freud says that Civilization ends to a sense of anxiety. And internalization, what part of internalized or externalized in a CEO, in an executive, and how he or she should change his or her personality characteristic or body shaping or other parts and higher stress and stability. It is the, one of the greatest things in entrepreneurship and high money, high salary paid to executive managers. Why? Because it is entrepreneur. If they should have received some good stock, some good shares, uh, and good, uh, be a good shareholder in the company or no, in the other side, in the opposite side, we can see the good salary for executive managers of a company in the entrepreneurship, in the beginning company. Why? Because they should tolerate a lot of instability and they should tolerate and manage a high level of stress, high level of anxiety about the decision making, about the market monitoring and other parts. You see that every aspect, every aspect you should have to be a good leader is about the, your mind. These are mental skills, every aspect. For example, saying no and assertiveness is one of the greatest 
and basic aspects and skills that a good executive leader should have. Every type of leadership, small business leadership, a country leadership, a thought movement leadership, a social movement leadership. You can see the leaders. They have a good mind, hopeful mind, serious mind, and with a good stable perspective about the future. Because of that, we think that to be a good manager and to be a good leader is relative to your mindset and attitude and a specific attitude. Honestly, we are not learning, teaching you the leadership. We should teach you how to think like a leader. And after that, you should practice those how to procedures, how to methods. The practice for you, not for me as an instructor, to practice for you. I only, at the best scenario, I only teach you the concepts of to be a leader. Sometimes these are characteristic, uh, character, personality-based and character-based features, yes. Sometimes they are social and acquirable and we can learn them, yes. It's a combination of genetic, family history, your race, your ethnicity, and more than important, your skill training. It's a great false, it's a false belief, very, very huge false belief that leadership is based upon your genetic. Yes, if you have a good genetic for leadership, you have greater tendency to play the leadership-based roles in your society. It's, it's only about the tendency. Talent is about the tendency, not about the actual work, not about, it's about the potential. For example, if you have a good talent, genetic talent for music, in regular life, you have some more tendency to play, for example, piano. If you don't have any talent or your talent or potential is not so high, okay, you don't have any higher tendency to play piano. It is not about the playing piano. Playing piano is a skill, practice and progress, practice and progress, practice and progress. It's about tendency. Because of that, in new industries like entrepreneurships, we can see the tendency of leadership in some people, yes. And I want to say you that one of the greatest parts of leadership coaching, it's a field of, a major field of coaching, it's called leadership coaching. It's not about the general managers of high companies. They don't need any leadership coaching. If they don't know how to lead their companies, why they are at that high level managerial situation. No, it's about the entrepreneurs. Some people with good, high, effective ideas and sometimes good money and some executive knowledge. Why they don't have any executive leadership knowledge? They don't know how to lead themselves at first, how to manage themselves. It's a combination of business coaching, sales coaching, and life coaching. Together, it is leadership coaching. And the final part is about the nonprofit companies. You know that, generally speaking, we have two types of companies, for-profit companies and nonprofit companies. Also, when you say nonprofit, it is not about the non-benefit. It is nonprofit. Yes, we have some benefit and we have some cost. Constant benefit analysis is the basic part of every human action analysis. Why, for example, in psychology, when you are you go to a counselor and say, I want to have such a decision, for example, for marriage or for my changing my job or for immigration, for parenting, for uh, every type of decision, you can go to a specific uh, counselor or consultation, uh, consultation departments. The first question is about the cost and benefits of, the, of your decision. What are the costs? What you lost? And what you take, what you give and what you take. It is about the nonprofit. It is about the profit. The difference, the distance between cost and benefits should be loss or profit. If the benefits are greater than cost, 
It is called profit. It is the distance. Profit is not benefit. Profit is the distance between profit and benefit greater than cost. If the cost is greater than benefit, it is not profit, it is loss. Okay. At first, it, it means that we operate our company, we operate our actions in our company without any expectation of profit, no expectation. We only work for the same level of profit. We don't expect any profit. We bring the profit of our company, of our own agriculture to other parts. It is charity. Charity is something else, but very near to nonprofit. And sometimes uh, we don't bring out the profit of our company. Sometimes we reinvest it in other sides of the company. So, a nonprofit company, maybe not a charity company. Charity company is about the goal and the ideal, first idea of company. It is nonprofit. The second part is funds reinvested inside the organization. So corporation is, big, is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? Because every profit, every benefit is coming back to the reinvestment of company. We have a public service mission. It's very important that our strategy, it is about reinvestment, but our mission is public service and voluntary board of directors. Okay, board of directors as a leader, as a manager in nonprofit companies and nonprofit organization, it is usually ordered that you cannot receive any salary as a board of director, as a, for example, top management team and other parts for leadership or management, management of a nonprofit company and funded through various private and public contributions. Through various private and public contributions. So when money is not enough for you as a nonprofit company, a lot of people, something like charities, a lot of people will contribute with you, with your company for the survival of company and for development and improvement of the company. You see that. Okay. You see donors and recipients. Individual donors, members, foundations, government grants, other contributors. These are the donors to nonprofit company. And recipients are individuals, members, communities, and other organizations. Leadership is between these two parts. Leadership is about the taking from donors and giving to the recipients. It is the role of leaders in nonprofit organization. And leadership challenges in nonprofit. At first, leaders must rely on participatory leadership to build consensus. It is very important because there is no salary. There is no money. There is no profit for people who work with a nonprofit company. So we should have a mindset of participation and leadership should create and participate the participation mindset between the members of the company. A strong ethical requirement. It is very important that, especially more especially in nonprofit companies, it is something like, for example, religious leadership or FAUT school leadership. It is very important to be a role model for other people because they look at to you, not as a very spiritual man or woman, but they think, yes, humanistic part of this Gentlemen, this lady is the dominant part. Altruism is the dominant part of his or her mind, his or her character, his or her heart. It is very important. So because of important role of ethics in defining the spirituality in every aspect of human life, when you are a leader for a nonprofit company, you should have a very strong ethics 
for your job. Also, it is not your job, it's your function. Something more than your job for earning money because there is no earning money. It is the nonprofit company. And motivating and retaining employees, it is very important again, because for example, when I uh, was talking with the managers of Goodwill, I talk about the, how can you motivate other people to work with you, for you, in your stores, not donors, donors are outside of the Goodwill, but some people are working here and they said to me, there is no salary. They work free of charge for the company. It is motivating and retaining and retaining is very important. Very important, why? Because sometimes uh, for lower salary or no salary, non-profit, we have a very high rate of turnover. So motivating people, creating some inspiration inside them in their mind, in their soul is very important. And finding and training future leaders, it is very important, why? Because it is not an ordinary company that a leader, uh, undergraduate from the university or graduate from the university, mm, straight coming to a uh, nonprofit company and says, yes, this is the loss, this is the uh, benefit, and these are our workers, these are our turnover of workers and other parts. It's a nonprofit. So we should train other generation of uh, leaders before that we leave the job. It is very important. And the last part of nonprofit, it is leadership challenges. The CEO involvement in nomination of board members helps assure that members with the right skills and expertise are selected. It's very important. It is, you know, that CEO and uh, board of directors and uh, sometimes top management teams are different parts and uh, one part is dominant against other parts. Usually, top management team or board of directors are dominant on CEO or CEO is the executive part, executive hand of, uh, for example, board of directors. But now in nonprofit, we are together. Why? No salary and everybody wants to have an organized behavior. Together we are stronger. Together we are stronger. Organized behavior. As one of the greatest success philosophers says, um, organized activity, multiple rewards, organized activity, multiple. This type of organization, because of nonprofit and gaining uh, any money for board of directors, for the CEO, for the personnel, for the sales forces, and other parts. So, training and working together, CEO with the board of members, is yes, they are expertise skills and experts are selected. Those nominated by CEO may have a conflict of interest and a positive bias toward the CEO. It's very important. Very interpersonal relationship also is always important for organizing a company. But in nonprofit companies, interpersonal relationship is very important. Why? Because a lot of works are done based upon the trust and based upon the acceptance and based upon the have a good role model figure in our CEO, in our uh, board of directors. They are not our idol, yes, but they are our role models. We want to be like them in the next years. Or we appreciate God and others that, yes, I appreciate God to have such an EAC, such a CEO here in my company as a nonprofit company. And creation of a balance of members nominated by different stakeholders is essential. This is the, the, some financial part, yes. But these financial parts should be monitored and should be supervised by the leader of the nonprofit organization. Except of that, we have a severe turbulence and severe disturbance in the cash flow in our company as a nonprofit company. And the major part and major uh, goal of a nonprofit company is to do things without any turbulence about the financial parts. Legally, it is very important when you say to government, to the federal government or to the state, said this, yes, we are nonprofit. We have a very, very, very empirical, rigid supervision on your cash flow, on your financial flow. 
and other parts because of the main core goal and main core mission and vision we have created, we have set for our company, it's very important to have a good supervision, supervised, uh, financial problems should be supervised by the CEO. Thanks for joining the class. I think that it's a good class also. I don't have any students joined with me in this class, but I am happy that you can see this class in your uh, Moodle course room. And happy Thanksgiving. Bye.